on excuses, says Trowick, you allow your false self, the ego, to contemplate what you do not want or why you cannot create it for yourself. That's what an excuse is. I can't do this. I'm too old. It's, I, I'm, it's past my prime. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be risky. Every excuse that you have is a contemplation. The presence of excuses in your life is evidence that you contemplate what you can't do or have, rather than the infinite possibilities that are inherent in the divine creative self. You see how an excuse is a contemplative action focused on what you don't want or what you can't get or why, or why you can't have it. He said, to rid yourself of excuses, you must learn to practice contemplating what you intend to manifest and simultaneously detach from the outcome. These are my conclusions, my words, okay? So you want to rid yourself of excuses in order to practice contemplating what you want to manifest, what you intend to manifest, and then you detach from the outcome, you let it go. And finally, he says, contemplate like God does, with thoughts of how may I serve rather than what's in it for me. You become more of a divine being. There was a great teacher from India who came over here in the early part of last century. His name was Vivekananda. And he said these words, or words similar to them. He said, if you want to know how to do this, if you want to know how to get rid of this ego, this false self, and really tune into the authentic self, which needs no excuses, he said, in the springtime, go out and observe the blossoms on the fruit trees. He said, the blossoms vanish of themselves as the fruit grows. So too will the lower self, the false self, the ego, vanish as the divine grows within you. You don't have to defeat anything. You don't have to beat anything. You don't have to win. You don't have to be ahead of somebody else. You allow the divine to grow within you, and that's the essence of the paradigm. I saw a uh, documentary film recently. It was unbelievable. It's called Man on Wire. And it's the story of the guy who, uh, who rigged a wire between the two towers of the uh, World Trade Center back in 1974. And he was, in, um, he was in his dentist's office. He was a young boy. And this was before the World Trade Centers had even been built. There was an artist's conception of what they would look like. And this is a man who liked, he just lived on a wire. He loved to do the type wire, and it was just amazing to watch him do this. And he's at the, you see there are pictures of him on the edge of the World Trade Center, a quarter of a mile up in the air, walking like this. At any rate, he had a vision, and he tore that out of the magazine. He tore that picture out, and he put it in his pocket. He had a toothache. He forgot about his toothache. He left the dentist's office, and he went and he contemplated this thing from a young boy until he did it in 1974, and he did it in other places as well in his imagination. And to be able to accomplish what he did, they had to smuggle a ton of equipment with, by guards who were standing guard at the top of the World Trade Center. And then he had to take a bow and arrow, and he had to shoot an arrow with a string across, all the way across, so it landed on the, 200 feet away, he had one arrow to do it, and it landed just on the edge. And then they pulled the string, and then they pulled the rope, and then the rope was attached to a cable, and they had, and they had a whole group of people doing this, of course, I don't know if you remember this in 1974, but uh, the reason it's called Man on Wire, because that was the crime he was accused of. They didn't know what else to accuse him of. <laughs> and not only did he walk across the World Trade Center as his dharma, as something that he knew he had to do, but as soon as he would get over to the edge and the police were up there to grab him, he would just smile. And then he'd turn around and he'd walk back this way. And he'd go down on his knees and he'd do a little dance. A quarter of a mile in the air. And he did it at the Notre Dame, the, the two towers of Notre Dame. This is his life, man on wire. But the reason I say that is when you contemplate like that, and when you have an imagination like that, you know, you, you have to create it. So he, he asks us, instead of thinking about, um, about what might happen, Troward asks us to think from the end. Another one of these principles is called willingness. How willing are you to 
attract into your life what you want and to rid yourself of the excuses. The willingness means suspending all of your blame. It means taking total responsibility for everything that is in your life, including the means that were handed to you by your well-meaning parents and their neighbors and, and so on. To say, I did it all. It also means surrendering. Willingness means, you know, in, in the recovery movement, and many of you know that uh, I have been without alcohol, for, alcohol now for 20 years plus, and just gave it up. And the reason that I gave it up, and the, way, the reason I was able to do it, was through being willing to say, I surrender. I just let go. And what? Let God, right? And allow this divine service. You see, if the ego was in charge of you, then why would you get old? I was sitting in an interview today with Kenny Blanchard, and he's turning 70 and I'm turning 69. And I said, you know, if the ego was really in charge, we wouldn't be sitting here in these 68-year-old bodies. <laughs> so we'd keep it about 23, wouldn't we? <laughs> because, you know, that's when we feel that we're the most powerful. and we're the But there's something else that's in charge. And not just in charge of our bodies and its aging, but there's something you have to surrender to that's even bigger than all of us. And you have to be willing to do that, to know that everything that you came here to do is a part of that. Willingness means shedding all things that you're unwilling to do. I remember when uh, I did my very first PBS special back in 1999, and I went around the country, and I visited PBS stations in every market. It made no difference to me how many people were there, whether it was a tiny little market or a very large market. Whatever they asked me to do, I said, I have nothing on my unwillingness uh, category. And I made over 170 station visits, very often paying my own expenses and uh, living on a very, very tight budget. But I knew that I wanted to take the messages that I'm speaking about here and that I spoke about in my earlier program, and there was nothing I was unwilling to do. I did it when Erroneous Zones was published back in uh, 1976. Bought up the first two printings, went across the country, paid for my own expenses, 14-hour days doing interviews, whatever it might be, whatever it takes, just have that willingness. Virginia Woolf, no one's afraid of her, right? <laughs> she had a wonderful line. She said, arrange whatever pieces come your way. Whatever it is that comes your way, no matter how tough it may be, whatever, arrange whatever pieces come your way and make it work for you.